Hi everybody, Aaron Dillon here with Outdoor Legion and today I'm going to be going over ropes and knots. The first thing I want to talk about is the terminology so you understand when I say some type of part on the rope or a knot you'll understand what I'm talking about. The first thing is the rope itself, the end that you're going to be tying knots to is called the working end or back in the days like the sailors they would call it the bitter end. The other pile that's sitting next to you is the standing end. It's standing there in a big pile waiting is kind of how they describe it in the Ashley's Book of Knots. When you pull somewhere in the center of the rope, the rope out like this, that's called a bite. And a bite is when you treat these two ropes as one rope. For example, we tie an overhand knot with one rope and you can tie it in bite, pull up the two ropes, and you can tie the same knot. You treat those two ropes as one rope. That's called in bite. And a lot of knots can be tied in bite. When you make it like this, make a loop like this, this is called a turn, or a single turn. There is two ways to make that turn go, obviously. This is a inside and an outside turn. And it's very critical on a lot of knots like the bowline, sheep shank, sheep bend. Those all have to be bent the right way or turned the right way to be a correct knot. From that turn, you have another loop inside like this. That is called a round turn. And two round turns is Two loops up top inside that turn. All right, let's talk about lashings and wraps. Lashings and wraps are basically when you take coils and wrap it around an object or another rope. It's most of the time used for lashing two hard pieces of something, wood, metal, whatever it is, or lashing a stick to a fixed object. Once you're going around one way with the lashings, perpendicular to whatever way you just wrap. So if we wrapped around my hand here, in this direction, if I started wrapping perpendicular to it like this, that would be called a frap. So you lash something one way and then across it you start frapping it. And that tightens down that lashing between those two objects and then you would finish it usually with some type of hitch like a clove hitch or something. Now let's talk about tying a knot slippery or slipped. It's changed over the years from the day they would always say tie a slippery knot if you were on a ship or something and then somewhere along the line somebody else started calling uh, a less secure one slipped. So, I only tie a slippery basically, which is, if we were to lash around this hickory stick here, this half inch doesn't want to hold on to it, but take this lash around this tail, you pull this tail, and it pulls that loop out, and the knot falls. That's all slippery is. And you can modify many knots into a slippery form. The last, usually the last leg that you push into the knot, you put it in, in bite. So you can pull that bite out and then that usually capsizes the knot. Now, when you're tying these knots, I was always taught in climbing school that you tie the knot, you tend the knot, or as, as time went on, it was called dressing, or it's called setting the knot. You tie the knot, you tend, dress, or set the knot, and then you test it. So it's tie, tend, test is what we were taught. And when you tend that knot, you make sure that all of the knot is in the right places. There's few, a couple knots that it can be out of order, like a figure eight knot or a bowlin. So when you're tending it, you're managing the knot, how it looks and in its symmetry and you're cinching it down and then you test the knot. 
you put it under full load and if it doesn't roll or capsize then you're good to go and then that moves into the next terminology which is capsizing and that means when your knot pulls through itself and unties and it's a catastrophic failure when the knot capsizes so some knots like the bowlin and some of the other sheet bends if you don't tend those they will capsize but once you tend them they're some of the best knots there are so it's a critical procedure to tie, tend, and test your each knot that you use. Unless it's not critical, if it's just you're tying down something, whatever, then it doesn't matter. But if you're putting any type of value into it, like your life or some type of material, then you want to tend that knot and make sure that it's properly dressed. Next thing that we're going to talk about is coils and flakes. Basically, when you're putting your rope into a storage position, I'm just going to coil this up into a bundle. When it goes in a perfect circle like this one, I started, I just coiled it in a circle and then I bundled it in the middle. That's called a coil. When you do it like a figure eight, it's called a flake. And flakes are usually less likely to tangle when the rope is being ripped away. So on a ship, they would, on the deck, they would roll, they would stack their ropes in a figure eight form. And th this alternating stack here stops it from tangling, makes it a big difference. If I was just gonna make a round coil here and they pulled it away real fast, there's a high percentage that it's probably gonna pick up in a big rat's nest halfway through. So, those are a couple terms for when the rope is stored. The next thing I wanna talk about is multiple names. Most of the knots have multiple names. So don't get confused if I say, I'm going to tie a taunt line hitch, and you've seen it as a midshipman's hitch, they're the same knot. Actually, many knots have multiple names, five or six. Um, lark's head and cow's hitch, and uh, a lanyard hitch, bail sling, ring hitch, those are all the same knot. And that basically came because ropes and knots have been around so long that as time goes on somebody renames the knot because they thought they just found it and it was actually somebody else's knot that made it earlier on and in different parts of the world they called that same knot they found it out uh, independently and they both named it different knots so there's all different types of uh, names for knots and terminologies just like the tending it's tending dressing or setting and bitter end, working end. So that's kind of confusing in the knot world, just to put that out there, that don't be confused about that. Let's talk about the criteria that I put on a knot when I want to put it into my permanent mental toolkit. It has to have a few prerequisites before it can make it into my toolkit. Four exactly. The first one, how strong is the knot? I'm usually looking for the strongest of the strong knots and then I weed it out from there. Does it jam when it's been put under extreme load? How easy is it to tie and untie in multiple different directions, upside down, backwards? And then how easy is it to remember that sequence of tying it? Does it, does it have a little a uh, story rhyme or something that goes along with it like the bowl in the rabbit comes out of the hole around the tree and back into the hole stuff like that um, or is it a complex knot where you have to have owned that knot tied that knot a thousand times and you own it in every direction upside down everything it's it's it takes a little more practice to get that knot good so those are the four and I've basically out of the 4,000 some knots, I think in the Ashley's Book of Knots, it references 3,850 different knots, um, which is an amazing amount. Uh, it's because there's so many different variations and then you get into the weaving and mat making and that's a, a large percentage of it, probably a third of it. Out of that big stack of knots, I think you should know 15 basic knots that will do almost everything for you. And if you don't learn those 15, learn at least the five 
the beginning five that are the most valuable, one in each category. One end loop, one mid loop, one bend, one hitch, and one stopper. You should know all those, one in each at least. And if not that, I, I, should, I believe you should learn about 15. In mine, I have about 50. And that gets me through almost any situation, even with my specialty knots. Another thing I want you to observe in when you're tying knots is what I call the over-under pattern. And what it is is as the line progresses through the knot, if you're tracing it like this figure eight here, if we trace from the working end and we go in, we're going under the line, now we should go over. The next one should be under. And it keeps going in that pattern. The next one should be over and it is. Now it goes under and then over and then under and then over all the way out. It's complete symmetry of an over under pattern. And that is prolific through most of the knots. There are some knots that, some complicated knots that don't do that, but for the most part, the knot has to continually be going over and under or it's not gonna wanna bind onto itself and create a knot. It'll just untie. There's many knots that you tie with the wrong turn and it capsizes or it doesn't even tie it just unfolds as soon as you try to pull it together and one is the bowline so that's something to take note of